Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Joe Scavato. For those of you that I haven't met yet, uh, I get to serve here as the pastoral resident at Chapel Street Church, and I'm so excited to spend a little bit of time with you today. Hey, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever had an experience like this? A few years ago, uh, my wife Judy and I, we were driving and uh, we stopped at a gas station. We had to fill up our car with gas. And, and while I was doing that, I noticed that there was a man sitting outside of that gas station. And he was an older guy. He had a really long beard and this big backpack uh, sitting next to him. It looked like he had been there for several hours. And, and so I was filling up our car and I was just about done. And as I was finishing up, he came over to us and asked us a question. He said, hey, do you guys have any money that, I could, that, that you could spare that I could have? And so like I said, we were just about done. We were on our way somewhere important. And so I kind of brushed him off. I was like, sorry, man, can't help you today. And, but while I was saying that, my wife got out and she kind of interrupted me and she said, hey, we, we don't have money, but, but if, we, if you want, we could go inside the gas station and we could buy you some essentials, some things you might need. And so I kind of look over to her because she made me feel like a bad person. So now I'm kind of annoyed. And, uh, and, but I said, okay, we'll do that. That's fine. Um, so we go inside and we, and we tell this guy, okay, so, so we'll give you $20 for a budget um, to, to any essentials you might need. No questions asked. Does that work? Yes. Okay, perfect. And so he goes in and he's walking around. And a few minutes later, you guys, he comes back and his arms are just like overflowing with stuff. Like he's got so much stuff that this, this has to be, you know, twice as much as this budget we gave him. He's got like a rotisserie chicken in one hand. He's got like some lottery tickets, which I don't think that's an essential, but okay. Um, and he, he, there's like a path of things that he had dropped, like Hansel and Gretel, because he, you know, couldn't hold everything. He had, he, he was just loaded with stuff. And so now I'm not just annoyed. I'm, I'm getting kind of mad because, you know, this is why people don't do nice things, because this guy is taking advantage of our kindness. He's ripping us off. And so I start revving up, and, and I'm going to tell this guy off, right? So I think I even got out the words, now listen here, which is like such an angry dad thing to say. Like, like have you ever said, now listen here, in that tone, and then said something kind or loving? Like, now listen here, you're a wonderful person, and I love you. No, that's not what I was going to say, at least. But, but before I could finish this, this rant to this guy, my wife cuts me off again. And she looks at him, and she says, okay but are you sure that's enough? And he looks at her, he looks at me, and without saying a word, he just turns around and he starts getting more stuff. And I was so mad. Like, I was, I was about to lose it right there. You know, I, we're going to be late to where we were going. This guy is taking advantage of a nice thing that we were trying, well, my wife was trying to do, it's not me. And now my wife's not even listening to me. So, you know, there's just a lot going on. And I was just kind of sitting in this anger, completely forgetting the fact that she was doing something that each one of us is called to do. She was loving her neighbor. Now, just to clarify, I don't think loving your neighbor means letting people ripping you off. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that my wife's a better person than me. <laughs> I try to work that in as early as possible every time. No, no, what if we ask this question instead? What if we ask the question in light of that story, what is loving your neighbor worth to you? What does it cost to love your neighbor? We're in week three of this uh, series called Won't You Love Your Neighbor? And that is the question today that we're going to try to be answering. And we're going to look at a very familiar story to do so. If you were with us a couple weeks ago when we launched this series, we actually talked about a conversation that leads directly up to our story today. It's located in Luke chapter 10, and it says that Jesus was approached by this expert in the law who asked him a question, and he was trying to trip Jesus up, trying to trick him, and, and he asked a question, the most important question any of us could ask. What must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus answered and said, what, what do you think? What, what would you say the answer is? And, and the man responded and said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The story continues, and it says that this man was trying to justify himself, and so we asked another question. He said, who is my neighbor? In other words, how, how many people do I really have to love? Like, what is the minimum love that I can give out in order to be justified, in order, in order to be good enough? How much is this really going to cost me? Who is my neighbor? 
We're going to try to answer that question today as we read the story of the Good Samaritan. And so if you have a Bible, you can open with me to Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 29, but it'll be on the screen as well. Let me read for you. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. What does it cost to love your neighbor? I think this story has a lot to say about that question, but first what I want to do is I want to talk about the two people, the two men in our story for which the cost was too high. We're going to start and we're going to talk about a surprising failure, a surprising failure. Have you ever found yourself in a, in a situation in life where maybe you knew what you believed about something, but then that belief was put to the test? So like, for example, I remember when I was in high school, I was learning how to drive and I would drive around with my parents and they would say something to me um, that, that maybe you've said or you've heard yourself. They would say, do what I say, not what I do. Do what I say, not what I do. In other words, yes, I believe it's important to follow the law. I believe that you should follow the speed limit. I'm going to teach it to others. But do I really believe it when I'm running late in the morning? That is when your beliefs are put to the test, right? I thought about that that day when this man came to us asking us for money outside that gas station. You see, there were a few details that maybe I left out when I was telling you that story. I mentioned that we were going somewhere important and that I didn't want to be late. Well, what I didn't tell you is that important place was our church. And not only were we going to church, but I was on staff at that church. And not only was I on staff at that church, but I was going to be preaching to a group of students that day. And not only was I preaching to a group of students, I was teaching them this exact topic. No, I'm just kidding. That would have been crazy, though. <laughs> that would have been fun. <laughs> you see, if anyone that should have known to treat this man with love and compassion, it should have been me. I knew the commandments. I believed them. I knew what was right. I even taught it to other people. And yet, I wonder what the man would have said if you had asked him what he thought I believed. I don't really want to know the answer. But I think that there are a couple people in our story that maybe can relate to that feeling. And so let me just read a couple of verses for you again um, at the beginning of our story when Jesus is asked this question, who is my neighbor? Verse 30 says, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So Jesus is asked this question, who is my neighbor? And he responds, as he so often does with a story. And the people hearing the story at first glance, a lot of it wouldn't have actually been that surprising. You see, this road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a famous road at that time, and it was famous for its danger. I think we have a picture of it. Um, so that's obviously modern day, as you can see their backpack, but, but that's the road, and you can kind of see how it turns and the rocky terrain, and, and something that you can't see in that picture is between Jerusalem and Jericho, it goes downhill thousands of feet. And so there would have been plenty of places for robbers to hide and, and to attack, which is exactly what happened. In fact, the only surprising thing so far is why would someone even travel alone in the first place? It would have been a foolish thing to do, and it wasn't commonly done at that time. And yet that's what happens to this man. 
Now, can you imagine how he must have felt? Can you imagine the pain and the hurt that he found himself in, maybe even crying out for someone, anyone, to come and save me? Maybe you can imagine that. Maybe not in this exact situation, but you too have found yourself in a place where you've recognized just how much you are in need to be saved, to be rescued by someone for a cost that you can't pay. And then who shows up? In, the, in his crying out, in his, in his praying to God, in his wondering who is going to come save me, who shows up but a priest and a Levite? Two people whose jobs were literally to love God and to love people. When we first read this, it seems like, you know, this is God sending someone into this man's path to save him. You know, this is an answered prayer. It's amazing. But what happens? Both of these men see this guy lying in the road, see him in his pain, see him in his situation. They're aware of what's going on, and they make the choice to cross to the other side of the road. You know, this is like if you were stranded on a desert island and you see a ship sailing by and you're waving on the shore and you said, come and save me. And they're aware of where you are and they just keep going by. It's heartbreaking. It's devastating to this man. People that have studied this story will tell you that there are quite a few reasons why this would have happened. You see, maybe this priest and this Levite were, were afraid. Maybe they thought that the robbers were still around and maybe they were in danger too. Others think that, you know, maybe they thought, you know, I don't have the medical training to help this guy. I'm not a doctor. I'm a priest. You know, what could I even do? Many scholars, though, believe that it's most likely that both men would have known that if they were to help this guy then, and, and if he were um, to lie there and then to die while they were helping him, that that would make these men ceremonially unclean, that they would have to go back to Jerusalem to perform this whole ritual in order for them to do their jobs, and it would cost them a great deal of time and a great deal of money. And maybe they decided, you know what, this cost is just too high. It's not worth it, and I'm going to keep moving. Ultimately, though, I don't, uh, we, we don't know the reason, and I think that matters too. You see, we don't know why because the why doesn't matter. The greatest commandment is not to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor when it's convenient. It's not to love your neighbor when it fits in your calendar. It's not to love your neighbor when the cost is manageable is to love your neighbor as yourself, to recognize that we too have been in need, and to love others as we have been loved. I don't know about you, but I can see a little bit too much of myself in this priest and in this Levite. You see, I was just like them. I had a great excuse to not help that guy that day. I was on my way to church to teach kids about the Bible. What could be more important than that, right? And yet sometimes I think that, that we let our plans get in the way of God's priorities. You see, the person that God wanted me to love in that moment was not at our church. And he didn't need a pastor. He needed a neighbor. He needed a friend. He needed hope. He needed to know that there was someone, anyone out there who saw value in him, who cared for him, who didn't see him just for his situation, but who saw him and loved him. I think it's so easy for, for me and maybe for some of you as well just to, to make excuses, to come up with reasons that keep us from loving our neighbor. And I can come up with some good ones. But the good things stop being good things when they get in the way of the most important thing. The good things stop being good things when they get in the way of the most important thing. Luckily for this man, the, these two guys were not the only ones on the road that day. And after our surprising failure, we see a surprising hero, a surprising hero. One of the things that uh, Judy and I love to do is people watch. Maybe some of you are like us, and, and we just love observing how people interact out in the world. And, and one of our favorite places to go and do that is the Cheesecake Factory. That's kind of like our, our go-to celebration restaurant. And a few years ago, we were at the Cheesecake Factory. And if you've been there, maybe you know they have some of those tables that are like six inches apart from each other. Like you're right on top of each other. And, and they, they sat us down at one of those tables at the Cheesecake Factory. And a few minutes after we sat down, a couple sat down right next to us. 
And this couple appeared to be on a very awkward first date. And let me tell you guys something. I didn't say a word to Judy that whole night. She didn't say a word to me. And we had the most fun just spying on this couple. It was like we were so, you guys don't even understand. We were so invested in this conversation that these two people were having. Like, I hope they got married or I'm going to be devastated. Like, you know, we were like, oh, yeah, good question. Way to ask that one. Oh, no, don't bring that up on a first date. What are you doing? Like, we had so much fun. It was, it was the best, which is kind of sad for us. But that's okay. Sometimes, though, we see people very differently. You see, when this man approached us asking for money, we saw the same man, we saw the same situation, and we heard the same question. And yet how we looked at him couldn't have been more different. You see, without even realizing it, when I saw this guy, I asked myself a question, and it was this. What will happen to us if we help him? What will happen to us if we help him? Will, we, will I be late to my job? Will I get in trouble for that? Is he going to rip us off? Are we going to spend too much money? You know, money's already tight. I don't want to do this. Like, what will happen to me? And so often I find myself looking at people as problems. But I think there's a better way. And I think my wife showed it to me that day because when she saw him, she didn't say what will happen to us if we help him. She said, what will happen to him if we don't? What will happen to him if we don't? And that made all the difference. You see, the way that you see someone will determine everything about how you treat them. And it will determine everything about how much you will be willing to sacrifice for them. And one of the costs of loving your neighbor is sacrifice, is giving up something for the good of another. In our story today, after this man had been given up on twice, had been rejected twice, we see that sacrifice too. Let's pick up our story in Luke 10, verse 33. It says, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. This is an incredible thing that happens, isn't it? It's amazing. But it's something that's made even bigger when you understand some of the context and some of the history behind what this means. You see, the Samaritan people and the Jewish people couldn't be farther apart. They were enemies, and they had been for years and years and years. In fact, one chapter earlier in Luke chapter 9, Jesus himself was rejected by a Samaritan village. They refused to let him enter their town because he was a Jewish man. This is like, and so for for him to make a Samaritan the hero of the story would have been shocking. The crowd would have been in silence. It's like if you came up to me and you said, hey, you're going to be rescued today by a Green Bay Packers fan. Like, it doesn't even add up. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. This is the person that thinks different than you politically, that believes different than you spiritually, who lives a different lifestyle than you. That, you know, that person, when if you see them, you kind of go the other way. You try to avoid them. This is all of that wrapped into one. And yet of everyone that Jesus could have chosen, it is the Samaritan man who saw someone who he should view as an enemy and instead did one of the greatest things that any one person can do for another. He saw him for who he truly was. He saw him and didn't see an enemy. He didn't see a problem. He didn't see someone and define him by his pain or see him as unworthy or unclean. He saw him as someone who was worth any cost, who had value. In other words, he saw him exactly as your heavenly father sees you. Verse 33 tells us that he saw him and then he had compassion. And the Greek word for compassion is actually pretty interesting. It's only used in a handful of places in the New Testament. And each time it's accompanied with an act of godly love. And so we have a few examples. Go and throw the first two up on the screen. And I want you to notice something about these examples. You see, before there was compassion, there was sight. Jesus saw the crowds. Jesus saw a large crowd. Go to the next two examples. When the Lord saw her, 
And in this last example, the, the story of the prodigal son, when the father sees the prodigal son, sight comes before compassion, which leads to love. And so for you, maybe the cost of loving your neighbor is first of all, seeing your neighbor and seeing them for who they truly are. Seeing them not for your differences, not for the problems, not for the pain that they have or the pain that they've caused, but seeing them and asking the question, what will happen to them if I don't? What will happen to them if I don't show them love? Judy and I don't have uh, kids yet. We uh, do have the 20-somethings version of kids, though, a dog. Um, and I think we have a little family picture. So that's our dog, Wrigley Scavato, um, middle name Field. And, uh, and he's, he's the best dog. But this picture doesn't really represent our family super well. I think we have a second picture. Yeah, so that's more our life. Um, just constant chaos. <laughs> and um, it, I saw someone post something uh, recently that, that said, there's no love quite like the love between a grumpy man and the dog he didn't want. And I think I'm living proof of that. It's a long, long story. We don't have time for it today, but I didn't want a dog. I was a very reluctant dog owner. Wrigley cost $14 from a dog shelter, and um, that was one of the only reasons I was okay with getting him. And, um, but he's growing on me, I promise. I love dogs, so let me make that clear. But, but uh, a few months after we got Wrigley, he started to have some pretty serious health problems, and, and we didn't really know why. He was losing a lot of weight. He wasn't eating, didn't have any energy. And as you can see from that second picture, he normally has a ton of energy. Um, and so it was actually kind of scary. We didn't know what was going to happen. Eventually, our, our vet kind of figured out what was going on and told us that there was a solution. And all we would have to do is, is give him some medicine for a few months that, oh yeah, was a ton of money. And um, he would have to go on this prescription food diet that, oh yeah, costs twice as much as normal food does. That was it. And so suddenly this $14 dog costs a heck of a lot more. Now, if you had told me when, before we got him that not only would I have a dog, but that this was the price tag for him to be healthy and happy, I would have laughed if you asked me to pay it. There's no way I would have considered paying that cost. And yet that day when we found out that news, not only did we pay it, we were happy to do so. Now what changed? Our love and our compassion for this silly, crazy dog had grown. Now if that's how I feel about a dog, I can't imagine those of you that are parents to humans, how you feel about your kids. And even that love we know pales in comparison to how God sees you. You see, compassion covers the cost of loving your neighbor. It was compassion that led for this man to see someone lying in a road half dead and not to stay at a distance, but to go up and see to him in person. It was compassion that led to him to giving up his resources, to giving up his medicine, his bandages, two days worth salary of his money, it was compassion that led for him to give this innkeeper a blank check and say, whatever else comes up, I will pay for it. It was compassion that led for him to give up his time. We don't know where this guy was going, but we can assume that he didn't plan on this. And yet he didn't let his plans get in the way of God's priorities. Compassion covers the cost. When we view people with compassion, no cost is too high. No person is a problem, and no energy is wasted when it goes towards loving your neighbor. That brings us to the last part of our story, a surprising challenge. A surprising challenge. It would be easy for me to kind of spend the remaining time that we have and, and really just kind of breeze past these last couple verses and then just go back to what the, the, the parable seems to be about. And we could give you advice on how to be the good Samaritan in your neighborhood and how to be a better person, and how to go and do more and be more. In fact, many of us maybe have heard a message just like that about this story. But my guess is that for a lot of us, we can't do more anymore. We can't do more anymore. Doesn't it seem like there's enough going on in your life? Aren't there enough people that you're being called to love and show compassion to? Don't you have enough responsibilities? And, and don't, it, doesn't it feel like when we add stuff like this that it's just another thing on your list that you just can't get to? 
But what if Jesus gave us this story for a different reason? What if it's not about doing more? What if it's about what's already been done? What if it's not about doing more? What if it's about what's already been done? After he finishes telling this story, Jesus asks the expert one final question. One final question in Luke 10, verse 36. He says, now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, I love how this story ends. I love how Jesus kind of wraps this all up. And and it's, it's subtle, so maybe you missed it. But do you remember the question that started this? He said, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus, when he ends it, says, who was the neighbor to the man? Now, the difference is small, but it's important because who is my neighbor was a question about the limits of the law. It was finding that minimum level of love, the least amount of people I can show love to in order to be justified. But this is no longer a question about the law. This is about love. Who was the neighbor to the man? The one who showed love, the one who had mercy, the one who had compassion who did whatever it took and paid whatever cost he needed to. And again, it would be so easy to just make that the the ending, to say, go be the good Samaritan. And and of course, we should want to grow in our love towards people. But the truth of this story is not that we are the good Samaritan. In fact, as I look at my life, I find that I have much less in common with him and, and much more in common with the man lying in the road. You see, just like him, I am in need of being rescued. Just like him, I have been crying out for help. Just like him, because of my past and my choices and my sin and and everything that I have done, I find myself with a cost that I am unwilling and unable to pay myself. And so are you. Jesus is your good Samaritan. He is the one that no one expected. He is the one that was willing to show love even when you treated him as an enemy. Romans 5 says that while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. He is the one that has showed us compassion beyond our understanding. He is the one that can rescue you from yourself and from the world even as you sit here today if you think that all hope is lost. He is your good Samaritan. And when we understand that, when we understand our place in this story, we realize that if we have been rescued, we are repurposed to show love to those around us. I still remember standing in that gas station a few years ago, just thinking about the cost that I wasn't willing to pay and and letting anger kind of take me over. And I was standing there and this man that had taken advantage of our kindness and, and ripped us off came back a second time. And again, his arms were just kind of overflowing with stuff. Those, you know, things that I take for granted every day. Things like a toothbrush. Things like deodorant. Things like water and food. And he came back to us and his arms were filled and he was crying his eyes out in the middle of a gas station. He was crying because he didn't understand why. He didn't understand why there was someone out there that would be willing to do this for him. And so we told him. We told him that anything that we could do, any act of kindness, man, we could buy him that entire store and none none of it would compare to the love that the God who created him has for him that day. And we talked for a while and we invited him to our church and, and then we left. And I couldn't begin to tell you what I preached about that day. But I will never forget him. I wish I could tell you that, you know, he showed up to church as well, and and he got saved and was baptized and is living a great life, and and I never saw him. I hope he does, but, but that's not the point of the story. You see, when we have been rescued, we are repurposed. And as we discover what that purpose is, God will position us in ways to love our neighbor and to go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Show grace to others as you remember the grace that has been shown to you. 
Offer forgiveness to others as you remember the forgiveness that has been offered to you. Love your neighbor as you remember the incredible love and the high cost that was paid for you. The lengths that God was willing to go to thinking about you. This is our challenge. This is why we love our neighbor. Not to be a better person, not to do more or or feel good inside or to justify ourselves. But because as the Apostle Paul writes, God demonstrated his love for you in this. While you were a sinner, Christ died for you. You and I were worth the cost. Now let's go and do likewise. Let me pray for you. Father, we're so thankful for this day and this time that you've given us. God, we're, we're grateful and, and humbled by the love that you show and the depths that you were willing to go to for me. Father, I ask that you would remind each one of us today that if that is the love that you gave to us, that we have been freed and we have been purposed and you will position us to go and do likewise, to love our neighbors at any cost. Lord, we're so thankful for who you are, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. We pray all this in your powerful name. Amen.